This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Sege, as I explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey everyone, welcome back. In today's era, there is a growing desire among residents to take charge of their energy consumption, not only to manage costs, but also to actively generate their own power. Traditionally, electricity has been generated at large power plants and transmitted over extensive distances to home and businesses, leaving consumers with little influence over the source of their electricity. However, advancements in small-scale technologies such as solar panels and on-site battery storage are empowering homeowners, businesses, and entire communities to become energy self-sufficient. In addition to these technologies, the integration of smart thermostats, vehicle-to-grid charging stations, and heat pumps is further reshaping the dialogue around energy generation, conservation, and being an active participant in an emission-free future. Today, Canadians have the opportunity to take control of virtually every aspect of their energy consumption and interaction. The landscape of energy is evolving, putting the power back into the hands of individuals and communities alike. So, here's today's big question. What role will innovative technologies and decentralized energy solutions play in shaping the future energy independence for individuals and communities. Joining us today is Dick Baker, an Ottawa area homeowner that recently published an article about his experience installing a solar panel system on his home. Dick is also the director of Ottawa Renewable Energy Cooperative, so brings a unique perspective on other small-scale renewable projects his organization has been involved in. Dick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Now, you recently published an article about the process of installing solar panels on your home. What inspired you and your family to make the switch to solar power, and why did you decide to share your experience in this article? It was a long process. Um, I actually have to go back to 98 when the ice storm hit eastern, northeastern the U.S. and Canada. At that time, I was working in the internet equipment business, and I watched the world stop and became fascinated with how it happened. And that caused a restart in an interest in energy that I had from the 70s during the oil crisis. And I found the electricity grid to become to be very similar to the telecom industry. Then in 03, so in 98, we were out of power here for seven days. The people across the road had power, so we were okay, but we just didn't have power in our house. We just lived with them. Then in 03, the trees in Ohio shut down North America again, and I couldn't believe that that could happen again. But at that time, Ontario was the last jurisdiction in North America to come back on stream fully. It took us almost four weeks for the whole province to come back. But Quebec was lit up okay, and they actually had bars on the on the whole side looking at the lights go off in Ontario. But I asked myself, why the heck is this? And I realized very quickly that it was because of our big nuclear plants. They're so big and so rigid. The premier at the time couldn't get the citizens of Ontario to turn off their air conditioning units because of the heat wave we were in. And Quebec was unaffected. Well, Why? And I learned it is the centralized nature of Ontario's power grid and the lack of demand management that we have here because of that. Anyway, I became fascinated with electricity, regulations, and all of that. And that eventually led to me becoming part of the Ottawa Renewable Energy Cooperative, where I learned through hard knocks the problems of the electricity system, the predatory protective regulations, and this new idea called distributed energy resources. Anyway, long and short, I finally uh, realized that we needed to do something at home, and that came about eventually to us putting solar on the house when certain regulations changed. I wrote the article so that I could share my experiences of how the Ontario electricity system works, what we can do about it, 
and I wrote it for the local community newspaper, the uh, Vistas. I live in Alta Vista. And uh, through my work at OREC and my own interest in this house and making it more efficient and cheaper to run, I learned an awful lot, and that information should be spread, I thought. Okay, Dick, in your article, you mentioned the challenges you and your neighbors face during the derecho storm that hit Ottawa in 2022 and the tornado in 2018. How did these experiences influence your decision to invest in solar and other distributed energy resources specifically? Well, a lot. They were instrumental. So I've lived in this house for 30 years in Alta Vista. We've been out of power for longer than five days, four times. 98 ice storm, the 2003 trees in Ohio that fell over and shut down North America, 2018 tornado, and the 2022 Direco. And then there was also another uh, big ice storm in the spring of uh, 23, but we'll leave that aside. It didn't affect us too much. So after the 2022 Direco, my neighbor and I were discussing what had happened. We were both out for 10 days, and he was beside himself because he didn't have anywhere to go. He wanted to get off the grid completely. And he knew I was involved in the Ottawa Renewable Energy Cooperative, OREC. And I told him, you can't go off grid because it's not worthwhile. It's not effective. You're getting a subsidized price of electricity, which didn't, he didn't like hearing that. But I said, you're just, we're just not paying enough for our electricity. We're getting it so cheap. It doesn't make sense to put solar on your roof. Besides, we both had trees on our south side. So that was then. And I explained to him the centralized nature of the grid. 60% of our power comes from three nuclear sites, Bruce Darlington and Pickering, Pickering being 14%. The pension funds like to invest in big centralized power plants, big shiny objects that the world can see. And the long lines that bring the power from way over there to our little corner is like a cash stream that the incumbents want to keep. They're not interested in distributed energy resources or DER spread around. But that's where we should be going. That time in 2022, knowing what I knew of the regulations and the orientation of the provincial government, I couldn't see ever having the potential to put solar on our house. Sorry, I couldn't see the financial justification of putting solar on the house. And on top of that, the uh, present government is subsidizing our electricity bills to the tune of $7 billion a year. Five and a half billion of that is going to general subsidies to the middle class and upper class, not targeted to the poor. So at some point, that's got to rise. The rating agencies will correct that by threatening to downgrade Ontario's credit rating. But all that to say, it's still subsidized, so it's not worth putting it on. Then in 2023, January, the Ontario government came out with some changes and uh, started encouraging net metering and local generation. Okay. Now, Dick, you also discussed the changing landscape of Ontario's electricity rules, specifically mentioning the Ontario Energy Board's directive in 2023. What changed that, in your opinion, helped to facilitate the adoption of solar power, and what challenges still exist for homeowners today? Thanks, Dan. That that uh, directive from the Ontario Energy Board in 23 was, was a game changer for the province. Um, I don't think they realized what potential they unleashed then. So from 2018, when the Conservative government took power, they had a big grid only mentality. They wanted big power plants and long lines to deliver the power to the homes. And the rules around net metering, which is the only way you can put solar on your house and stay connected to the grid. That's where you generate power, consume it yourself, and trade credits for your over summer for your summer overproduction for your winter consumption or purchases from the grid. So that pricing scheme was basically rigged against the homeowner because homeowners were forced to go to the tiered pricing scheme. So just on that situation in, up until 2023, net metering wasn't very cost effective because of the pricing, but it could work technically. The grid acts as a battery, so you're never out of power. So that rule kept me away from thinking of solar on my house. 
also I had trees to the south of the house. So the best place to put the solar panels wouldn't be productive. I don't want to cut the trees down because that keeps my air conditioning costs low and they're nice. But then in 23, the province changed the rules around net metering and came up with an ultra low overnight rate. So the key thing about net metering, they said the local distribution companies would have to give the net metering customer the option to pick their rate class. So you go to a time of use rate if you wish, and then you get value for your time value of electricity. So if you're producing in the high rate, you get the high rate in your credits. Okay, so that's good. Then they came up with an ultra low overnight time of use rate, third rate class, to encourage EV users to charge at night, not during the evening dinner time when everybody's turning on lights and heaters and all their devices. So they want to reduce consumption during the peak hour, increase consumption at the low hour. And if you produce solar during the 4 to 9 p.m. period at 28 cents, that's what you would pay, you get credits for 28 cents. That is much better economics for the homeowner, the EV user, and the solar producer. That's when I realized that my house was actually ideal because I've got a very low slope roof. The south side is full of trees, but the north side is clear. And the north side is going to produce more during the 4 to 8 o'clock p.m. in the summertime at 28 cents. So one hour of that can offset 10 hours at the 2.8 cents for the low rate. So that was one thing. The other thing is I have an EV. We have heat pumps. We just installed a uh, heat pump water heater. So I can time shift my consumption to the low overnight rate. I think it's pretty good. I still think costs of electricity are going to rise more. So my return on investment is only going to improve because putting all of this in is an insurance policy against that rising cost of electricity. You also asked, what are the continuing challenges? The challenges for solar on the residential side are buildings and trees. How's the building built? Which way are the roofs pointing? Where are the trees? What kind of shading do they throw? But the good thing is that in the summertime, the sun is very high in Canada. So the sun will come straight down, more or less. And in the wintertime, when there's not snow on your roof, or even if there's a little bit of snow on the roof, the solar production is marginally better because it's cold. So the physics are better. So there's still lots of opportunity for solar, even in this cold northern climate. Uh, the challenges are of course, buildings and trees to a certain point. The supply chain, there aren't enough installers, electricians to do all the work that should be done, can be done. Hydro Ottawa staff, just to get the installations done, the upgrades for the grid. But Hydro Ottawa needs Ottawa residents to spend this money on their own DER so that you can meet your new targets for DER. So I think People who do this on their own are doing it for themselves, but in, indirectly, they're doing it for the betterment of the overall grid, driving down the cost of electricity. Solar does not drive up the cost of electricity. Big, unproducing nuclear plants drive up the cost of, un, of electricity. Okay. Could you maybe provide more details on the cost and capacity of your solar panel system? What were the economic aspects of your investment, including any government incentives or rebates that may have influenced your decision. So in my specific uh, installation, I have 37 panels in total. 24 of them are on the north slope and 13 panels on the south slope. So total DC kilowatt of 14.43. That's going through a nine kilowatt inverter. I have no panels on the south slope because there are three big trees there. If I had panels there, it would probably be a third smaller for the same generation. So over 12 months, I expect to generate about 10,246 kilowatt hours. That's 78% of 2022's consumption. And my electricity consumption includes 90% of our driving, because I have an EV and a plug-in hybrid EV, 90% of our driving, 100% of our cooling, 40% of our heating, a little more than 40% this year because it's a warm winter, and 100% of our lights and appliances. So I've got a gas station on my roof, and I've got a furnace on my roof, effectively. Because of the ultra-low overnight time of use rate, 
I am confident that with time shifting, I can cover 100% of my electricity purchases, not my connection charges, 100% of my electricity cost with something like 78% of my electricity kilowatts because of the time shifting between ultra low and peak rate. The overall cost was $30,478 for the equipment plus HST, electricity upgrade to 200 amp service, some internal wiring changes, and I reshingled under the panels on the north and the east. I didn't do the, the south because it doesn't quite need it. Effectively, I future-proofed my house for 30 plus years of electricity. I've given myself 30 years plus of electricity price insurance and four savings. And I predict that the credit rating agencies at some point will force the province to reduce the subsidies we're giving to the middle and the upper class and electricity costs. And that'll drive up the electricity rates a little bit, not massively. And I'll be protected from that or whoever's living here because I'm getting old. So I think the house value of homes that have solar are going to hold their value better than a new kitchen cabinet or a new new whatever that the new owner pulls out and replaces. You know, you're not going to be replacing solar on a roof if it's reducing your utility bills. Okay, now, are batteries shifting your energy use away from daytime usage or other distributed energy resources a consideration? Well, that's a very good question because the one thing I haven't done in the house yet is put a battery and a disconnect to island. And that's the next thing I'm going to look at during the summertime. I do these things one at a time to make sure they work and see how they operate. So the next thing will be a battery probably in the garage, if it's appropriate, and a, um, a um, I'm not sure the proper technical term, a islanding device to allow me to, to operate separate from the grid. And if I ever buy another car, it'll be an EV with two-way charging so that I'll be able to charge my house and the battery over the course of the year. So the battery will be there for a disaster, but over the course of the year, I'll be able to draw power from the solar on the roof and from the grid at the low rate, store it and discharge it to the grid during the peak rate. So that makes my neighbor's grid a little more resilient. And in a crisis, I'm, I can be island, as opposed to the noisy gas generators that are sitting around my neighborhood. Shifting gears a bit now, as the director of the Ottawa Renewable Energy Cooperative since its creation in 2009. Can you share how it works and what are some of the projects that your co-op has built? Sure, certainly. Um, so OREC is a for-profit renewable energy co-op that enables residents of Ottawa. We're restricted to Ontario by certain rules that I, I won't get into. Uh, so it allows residents of Ottawa and, and mostly Eastern Ontario, but Ontario, to benefit from distributed energy resources in their own region. We build and own renewable energy generation, presently solar and wind, energy conservation assets, commercial building, lighting, insulation, retrofit projects that keep the electrons, jobs, and profits local. So we have 22 solar systems in place now. Most of them are the feed-in tariff contracts. Three of them are net metering projects, one on the Museum of Science and Tech, two at, at the French Catholic High School Board, Mer Bleu and Paul Demeret, and then um, 18 other feed-in tariff contracts uh, where we have a contract to sell the power to the grid. At a net metering project, we sell the power to the building. Then we also have two wind projects down in southwestern Ontario and three energy retrofit projects. We had five, but two of them have, have uh, finished their contract period. So the solar projects are on housing co-ops, barns, schools, museums, factories, and two of them are, their, I'd say, medium-sized ground mounts, 500 kilowatt. Uh, ground mounts. The two wind projects, one is a 2.3 megawatt project at Tiverton, just outside of the Bruce nuclear plant. And a little funny story I like to tell everyone is that the Bruce nuclear plant doesn't supply power to the neighborhood. All the electricity from Bruce nuclear goes to Toronto on the transmission lines, because if they connected it to the distribution grid in Tiverton, they'd blow all the light bulbs. So they feed Toronto, and then it trickles all the way back to Tiverton. The wind project that we have outside of Tiverton is a standalone turbine. 
and it feeds a distribution grid. So should, heaven forbid, should Bruce Nuclear go down, some of the people will have electricity coming from our wind turbine. The people that are working at Bruce Nuclear will have power at home, not because of the nuclear plant. The second wind turbine is an 800 kilowatt project in Zurich, directly south of there. That's a wonderful area for wind. Most of the wind projects in that area are large projects owned by American pension funds feeding Toronto. All of the power is going on the transmission lines. So getting back to OREC in general. So we have solar, wind, and lighting retrofits at um, the RA Centre, condo, and housing co-ops. All of our projects are revenue generating with proven technologies and uh, solid counterparties. So pretty comfortable with the security of those assets. Uh, The board is made up of pretty experienced people, engineers, lawyers, business development, accountants, comms people. I'm a bit of a generalist, uh, but I have worked in telecom and uh, technical fields my whole life, not as an engineer. We have 980 members, 500 of them, about half of them, have invested over $11 million in equity and debt in our projects since uh, started. And we've paid dividends every year since 2013 when our first project came online. We have repaid to our members over 3.5 million in dividends, interest, and capital repayment. Very little outside debt. We'd rather pay our members than banks. No offense, banks, but we want to keep the money within the family, within the community. Our main function is to act as an investment cooperative for our members. So we spend most of our time looking for projects to build and or buy, and then raise the community capital to build, operate, repeat, get more projects, raise more capital, pay out the dividends and capital. But we do have to spend an awful lot of money on advocacy work to change the regulations or maintain whatever regulations there are to promote distributed energy resources of all types. But the second core function that we want to do more of is utilize the knowledge of our thousand members and create them. It's happening already organically, but we want to have more regular information sessions between our members who are doing things like I just did. We have the largest concentration of any thousand people in in the Ottawa Valley, in, in the province, I think, of people who have DER installed in their homes. So we have a lot of EV users, battery users, people with knowledge of heat pumps and stuff like that. So we are a group of friends with knowledge of DER. Okay, now Dick, when did things really take off with the co-op and are members seeing dividends? Well, that's a good question because the, the first offering that we raised was in 2012, and we didn't know how it was going to go. It actually went better than we expected. Our minimum requirement was to raise half a million dollars. And in that nine weeks that we had, we raised uh, $970,000 and more cash than we actually needed for what we had to do. And ever since then, we've, we're now on our 10th raise. Each raise has gone better than expected we've always raised more cash than we had projects at that time. So for a period there, we were building up too much cash and didn't have enough projects for them. So projects come more harder than the money or the members. The membership has grown very well and the equity in the cooperative has been very well. And I'm also proud to say that we've paid dividends every year since 2013. And the last couple of years, it's been 4%. We'd like it to be higher, but um, we've had to build everything from scratch without any outside cash. We've just started our latest raise. It's going to close in August uh, 28th, I believe. And we're looking for new members, new equity, and that equity can be RSP or TFSA. It's an investment in the portfolio of 27 existing projects and the new projects that we're going to be building in the coming year. Now, Let's talk about the changing relationship between electricity consumers and producers. How do you see this evolving in the coming years? And what role do you think individuals and communities will play in the broader energy transition? This is going to be the biggest change in our society in the coming years, I think. We're going to move from being ratepayers with very little agency beyond paying our bills and turning off lights to prosumers or producer consumers who have the ability to produce electricity for conservation, 
which is what I'm doing, or for profit and or for profit when the regulations in Ontario allow Hydro Ottawa to buy excess power from homeowners. Right now you can't. So we'll be able to conserve and profit from our assets on our roof. And we'll also be able to actively manage our consumption again for conservation and profit. So right now we're able to reduce our demand and shift our demand from peak load to low load. But in the future, I, I'm pretty sure that Ontario will follow California and New York and allow for aggressive demand response programs. And what we'd like to do at some point in the future as OREC is allow our members to pool their batteries and solar panels and air conditioners so that we can turn down consumption as the grid gets choked or, or uh, constrained. So we just saw what happened in Alberta. They had no demand management program. They turned down some gas plants for a renovation in the peak of winter, and then they got hit with a big demand during cold, a cold period. The only th way they got out of their problem was begging their customers to turn down their home heating systems or turn down their demand. The citizens responded, but the downtown office towers left their lights on all night. That's absurd. So, but, so going forward, I think that the LDCs will be paying people to turn down their demand because we need the grid to be balanced. We don't need excess generation or excess demand or under demand. We need everything balanced. So a, a megawatt is as good as a megawatt. Okay, thank you for that. In your opinion now, what is the city or province doing well and what improvements need to be made? Now, you got to behave here. I'll try to behave. How long do we have? I don't want to rant, but it's hard not to. On the city side, if there's a climate emergency, act like there is one. People should not be buying coffee from an idling car. Housing is energy. Stop natural gas expansion. Get serious. The Better Homes program is a wonderful program of the city because it addresses the upfront costs of retrofitting and DER and solar and all those things. It ties that cost to a 20-year loan fixed to the house tax bill, not to the person. I'm 68. I may not be in this house 10 years. I tend to be here longer, but my intention and reality may be different. So we would need to have the cost of long-term assets spread over years. The Better Homes program does that. The city should be encouraging solar and small wind for resilience purposes. Every large roof should have solar, and there should be wind turbines scattered throughout eastern Ontario, not just in rural areas in batches of 50. There should be a couple of wind turbines in urban Ottawa with the proper setbacks. That's the city. On the province, every month Ontario is paying out $1.3 billion in gasoline and diesel costs. There's lots of money for the energy transition. You just have to shift it around. Let the nuclear plants run their course. Don't shut them down early, but don't pour money down a sinkhole. We just announced today a Pickering expansion. Well, Pickering retrofit. It's the oldest nuclear plant in North America. The province is in a pickle because they know the nukes will be late. The small modular reactors aren't small modular. They are big reactors. They can only go on the transmission lines. The demand is all over the province at the end of the distribution lines where we live and work and our EVs and heat pumps are. So just let the nuclear plants slow down or wear out. Uh, the Dunsky report to the independent electricity systems operator said the lowest cost of new energy in the province is DER of all types. It's just regulations that are stopping it. And it makes the province more resilient. So the province can do, have every city have a similar program to Ottawa's Better Homes program. Secondly, remove the Ontario electricity rebate that's putting $5.5 .5 million of taxpayer money into the pockets of people who leave their lights on and uh, put that money instead in the distribution lines, allow every kind of virtual net metering in the province, especially community solar gardens, so that citizens could own the solar on a swimming pool, hockey rink, any facility that's used for a disaster recovery facility 
should be generating power day to day and then have the ability to island in a crisis. And uh, resiliency should be the first order of the electricity grid. Proper costs, but resiliency and localized. And generally liberalize the rules around generation and distribution. Okay. Does the co-op or its members have an objective to promote or advocate for renewable energy and distributed energy resources in the community or with local governments? Yes, in every way. As a co-op and with other co-ops for community scale projects, 100 kilowatt to one or two megawatt is the size of projects that is natural for us. That's the kind of thing that citizens are going to be interested in and seeing and owning. But we are going to work in the bigger projects on the transmission side, but we're advocating for that all the time. Spend a lot more time helping our members to act as individuals with information and examples, the whole idea of friends with knowledge to get them to put in their own home systems. Uh, So yes, we spend way too much time advocating on behalf of DER. Okay. Now, Are you seeing your co-op's focus areas reflected in government policy, either uh, municipally or provincially? How do you ensure your voices are heard? We're starting to see a focus on DER, but I'm not yet seeing action, hard, hard action on DER, except for a few exceptions. Hydro Ottawa with the IESO is right now focused on solar DER as a conservation measure. There's a bunch of regulations around it. Won't get into that right now. So that's good. And the Dunsky report and the ultra low time of use rate, those are all very good things. But today they've just announced a massive expenditure on Pickering which locks us further into the centralized focus of the province. The orientation of all electricity grids is to build big things far away. That will break at some point. We're here in Ottawa and we see all these federal buildings. There's only a few of them that have solar on them. The federal government doesn't do a good job of buying from small organizations like us. So we've had lots of discussions with the feds, but they want to do massive things that the reporters can write about. We're advocating as ourself and with other co-ops nationally and provincially at every province, because that's where electricity and co-op law resides. And we have formed a, a national association called the Community Energy Cooperatives Canada, which is based in Saskatoon right now of 25 co-ops from across the country. The fastest growing area of of renewable energy co-ops in Canada is Alberta because they have the most liberalized power grid. So that'll be our national voice, but it'll be a voice at the federal and more importantly at the provincial level because that's where electricity lives. We work a lot with the European Res Co-op who have been very successful in Europe to get the EU to pass a directive that says every citizen of EU has the right to own, operate, store, share, and save their own renewable electricity. So if we can get the federal government to encourage, that's all they can do is bribe, encourage, and and embarrass the provinces. If we could get the federal government to pass a directive like that, that's EU Directive 2018-2001 if anybody's interested. If we get that kind of directive from the federal government, that'll put pressure and embarrassment on the provinces to loosen up their grids. Alberta and Nova Scotia have moved the furthest along in this area. Ontario and Quebec and Manitoba and Saskatchewan are the big laggards, but um, we have to move that way. And OREC, with our friends in the other co-ops, can push that. We're all voters. We're all voting with our money and our ballots. And the last thing, banks will notice the difference. Lastly, Dick, we always end our interviews with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. What are you reading right now? Well, two books. One is called Freeing Energy by Bill Nussi. It's all about the wonderful economics of home DER technologies. And the other is uh, by my favorite author, Guy Vanderhaeg, uh, August into Winter, an odd book, but Fascinating about Saskatchewan and uh, rural Saskatchewan and Manitoba, a crime scene set in 39 with the Spanish Civil War and the coming World War II as a backdrop. It's great. Um, What would you name your boat if you had one or do you have one? There ain't no easy road. 
Those are the words of a song I love called Jericho by Fred Eagle Smith. My wife gave me a paddle with this phrase on it a few years ago as a birthday present. Next, who is someone that you admire? Uh, Peggy, my, my wife, mother of my children, business partner, best friend, and um, a no BS problem solver. Okay. Um, what was the closest thing to real magic that you've witnessed? Birth of a child who grows into an adult who has a child. Now, as a result of the pandemic, many of us are guilty of watching a little too much TV or movies. Um, what is your favorite movie or show? What are you watching right now? I'd have to say the Danish movie Borgen. It's a, um, it's a Danish TV series on politics and the trade-offs and the personalities. It shows the human side of difficult decision-making. It's great. Lastly, what is exciting you about your industry right now? Well, the electricity industry has got the possibility to democratize energy, to revitalize communities and especially rural communities. So with renewables and DER and cooperatives, we can keep the electrons, jobs, and profits local. Okay, Dick, our listeners, if they want to learn more about you, how do they connect? Probably the best way is to go online and check uh, www.orec.ca, orec.ca, our website. Dick, this is it. We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you had a lot of fun. Cheers. I did. Thank you very much, Dan. It's wonderful. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Think Energy podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.